Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. I'm Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. We're certainly happy to have you here today. Before I get to the host of our show, I want to tell you a little bit about the guest we have today, an exciting guest, Ken Coleman. He's the number one national best-selling author of The Proximity Principle, the proven strategy that will lead to the career you love. At Ramsey Solutions, he hosts The Ken Coleman Show, a nationally syndicated radio show, part of the Ramsey Network that airs on 51 stations across the U.S. every weekday. Ken is a trusted voice, an expert who's been featured on Forbes, appeared on Fox Business Network, Yahoo Finance, and The Rachel Ray Show. His accolades go on and on. Ken is a very sharp guy. Um, He's got a new project we talk about today on the show. Can't wait for you to meet him. And without any further ado, let me introduce the host of our show, Ian Cron. Ken Coleman, welcome to the Typology Podcast. Ian, thrilled to be with you. Thanks for having me. Man, we have done a lot of stuff together. Yeah, we really have. We've we've had some fun conversations, uh, been on the same stage. Uh, which I don't belong anywhere that you are. I'm happy in any room that you are. I'll tell you that. That means I'm making progress in my life if I'm hanging out with you. Well, I'm not sure about that, man, because you, you've got you, you've got a lot going on. Tell folks, I mean, you, you, you're like one of those people who are juggling 50 balls successfully at the same time. So just tell people what it is you do and all these exciting projects you have coming up. Well, it, it looks like it, but it's actually not. Thank God for technology and great producers like Anthony's, the Anthony's of the world, because I get to do a daily radio show for two hours, and we put it on YouTube. It's on Sirius XM and 51 stations, and then we podcast it. So it looks like I'm everywhere, but it's just one show, because that's about all I can handle. But we're helping men and women every day uh, get clear on the age-old question, why am I here? What should I do with my life? And we're looking at it specifically from the workplace because we believe that people were created to contribute. And Mm -hmm. you think about how much time we spend in our lives at work. Um, We don't look at work as something we do to live. We think we live to work. In other words, we live to create something that we can then contribute to to our world, to make our world a better place. And so by, by looking at that conversation, we're helping men and women get clear on what it is and then how do they create a plan, and then strike out on a path to make that dream job actually a reality and, and live uh, on purpose and work in purpose. Amazing. So I always start the show with pretty much the same uh, two questions. The first one is, um, when did you first learn about the Enneagram? And how did you figure out your type? Well, this, Let's start with those two. This is kind of fun. And people are going to think this is a setup, but it's absolutely not a setup. So I first learned about Enneagram about five years ago. And it was when your book came across my desk. And at that time, I was host of the Entree Leadership Podcast, which is one of the top leadership podcasts in the country as a part of Ramsey Solutions, which is you know, the mothership for the Ken Coleman Show. And um, I've always been a big uh, proponent of self-awareness and self-discovery. And so my previous experience with personality tests had been pretty much limited to Myers-Briggs and the DISC. And so when your book came across my desk, um, you know, I had heard people talk about Enneagram. So I'd heard about it, but I had never had a real conversation about it, nor had I read the book or even taken the test. And so as a result of interviewing you, I actually, you sent me a link, uh, actually you didn't, we all know that your team did. And I took it <laughs> and then uh, I wanted to be able to really understand it and how it was different maybe than other tests so that I can interview you. And we had a blast and I, I made myself the guinea pig and let you psychoanalyze me. Um, and so that was my first experience with Enneagram. You know, I remember that interview distinctly because you were such a skeptic and, and you were basically, it was less of an interview than a soft interrogation. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Um, it, it's absolutely right because I had not experienced it and didn't realize at the time 
um, you know, how powerful it was. And so it was kind of fun for me to come at it that, that way. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a powerful tool. I've since become a fan of it. Well, you know, anytime I can get a convert, I'm happy. <laughs> so you discovered that you were what type? Uh, well, I tested as an eight. And in that interview, you know, what's funny is, is people that work closely with me, some people absolutely go, oh, there's no question about that. But a lot of people are like, I think you might be a three. And, and I wondered if, because I was skeptical and we kind of talked about that interview, uh, did I not test properly? But uh, it says I'm an eight, so I'm going to go with it. And I absolutely see a ton of that. You and I talked about that. Uh, so I, I guess I'm an eight. All right. Well, we're going to, maybe during this podcast, we'll go trying to get you past just guessing. All right. Well, what I mean is, is I believe that I'm an eight, despite what other people say, you know what I mean? Okay. You know how that goes. Okay. All right. That sounds good. So tell me, what do you like and dislike most about being an eight, the challenger, you know, this larger than life presence in the world? I do like that I can influence people pretty darn easily. Uh, right. I like that I'm able to cast vision effectively because of that. I like that I can, um, I was going to say nudge, but I think I've got to be transparent and say push people into action. <laughs> right. That an eight is capable of nudging. Uh, or tackling. <laughs> so I, you know, I think it's more of a push. Um, that's what I like about it. I like that I challenge the process. Right. Uh, I do. I'm not a skeptic, but I do. I do have questions about everything, and I and I don't accept things necessarily the first time I hear them. I want to ask a lot of questions, or if if I don't accept it, I really dig, and and I challenge the process. So I do like that. The part I don't like um, is that. Um, is the intensity that comes with it and the intensity being sometimes misinterpreted and other times just being darn insensitive. And I don't even realize that. Um, I don't like being intimidating. I'm not an intimidating guy, as you know, I'm five, eight and a half. Uh, but I do know that that personality type is intimidating. I don't like that because underneath all of that, I really am a people pleaser. Um, which comes in handy when you step on people's toes and accidentally, you know, you know, too abrasive. And then I find out that I am, obviously I'm just slayed by that. So that's the part I don't like. I wish that hmm. my intensity, uh, and, and the good news is, is being aware of this, I'm working on this, but even as a father, as a husband, right. uh, friend and coworker, I, I wish that I could temper my intensity at times. What number is your wife? A three. Mm. Interesting. And did she think you were an eight or a three? She absolutely thinks I'm an eight. Okay. And what's the dynamic like in your marriage? Between, <laughs> between an eight and a three, what's the dynamic? Well, it's interesting. Um, we're so alike in a lot of ways. Um, and so we don't disagree like we used to. It was fireworks for more than half our marriage we've been, we just hit 22 years. Um, so our marriage is a lot of fun. Um, but when we disagree, we've had to really learn how to uh, disagree agreeably because we're both very opinionated and, and very strong in our opinions. Um, it's funny, I'm the eight, but I tend to be the one that wants resolution quickly, even if I'm mm. not pleased. I still want resolution. She likes to hold on to stuff for a couple of days. She needs to chew on it for a while. And that drives me crazy because I don't like, even if I'm the guy that's, it's all my fault. I need you to hit me with everything that I've done wrong. I need to accept it. And I need to let you know that I completely agree and that I'm wrong and that I'm going to work on it. I need closure and she doesn't need closure. So I think that's where a lot of tension has been. Uh, right but we're both strong willed. We have our own opinions. And so it creates a lot of friction, but the good news is at 22 years now, we're, we're seeing less and less sparks from the friction and learning how to wrestle in that tension. Well, that's good. I mean, I think, you know, eights who are not particularly skillful, right. Yeah. Uh, can tend to get into arguments and deflect blame uh, very quickly. 
uh, and kind of not own their own part. Do you remember a time in your life when it was like that for you as a younger man? Yeah, I think early on I dealt with that more. When I got into relationship, I didn't date a lot. Uh, so I didn't have any really long relationships at all until Stacy. I got married at 23. Um, and I found myself more dealing with that um, with family members. Mm. Um, but when I got into relationship with Stacy, I, I found that I did not like how it felt to mm. cause pain. Right. So it was more when I was younger and really yeah. younger. And, but, but I'll be very, and I, I'm very confident in this. I have always been that, that weird dichotomy and, and I don't, you can explain it to the listeners better than I can. I've always been a people pleaser, even though I'm really strong, opinionated and strong. I do. I really don't like it when I upset somebody. I don't hmm. like it at all. I'm not okay with it. I'm really not. Interesting. That's interesting. So let me, it's good that your wife's a three, because I'll describe some of the dynamics and maybe it'll give you something to think about, about your own type. Yeah. So threes and eights um, often look alike. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I get a lot of, um, you know, people who get confused about whether or not they're a, a, a three or an eight, right? Because there's a lot of lookalikes there. They're both incredibly hardworking. They both have a great deal of energy. Eights have more energy than any other number on the Enneagram, but I would say that threes get more done than any other number on the Enneagram. You both can overwork. Uh, you're both driven to finish tasks and, and, and reach goals, no matter how much effort and time it takes. And you want to accomplish big things, you know, not small things. Uh, the difference being, though, that you, if you're an eight, are prone to forgetting your physical needs and limits. Yep. Like you, you'll push yourself until you get sick. Yep. You know, in, term, in terms of work. Um, both types can express anger when, when necessary, but they usually get angry for different reasons. Like threes will get angry because someone is blocking a goal that they want to achieve, you know, like, you know, at work, it's like, man, I want to kill it this quarter, but this person is kind of standing in my way. And so I'm going to have to run through them. You, you, you know, now, most of the time, they're more diplomatic than that. But that will make them, you know, uh, pretty angry. Um, I think with, uh, with eights, the, the anger is more about impatience yep. uh, with people, particularly if they suspect that person is demonstrating weakness or indecisiveness. 100%, man. I tell you, pet peeve right there. Is it really? Pet peeve is people who won't make a decision. Drives me crazy. Right. Uh, threes are more image conscious than eights. Yeah, this is uh, why people call me a three. Is it possible that I'm an 83? <laughs> <laughs> no but 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 they're very image conscious yeah and frankly they wouldn't they wouldn't care as much as it sounds like you do about necessarily hurting people yeah y y you know what i mean like they they're not very attuned to people's feelings and threes are much more attuned the, to people's feelings than, than an eight would be. Um, they're both direct and assertive. Uh, they both have trouble at times expressing emotions, you know? Uh, threes kind of avoid their feelings because they can kind of interfere with what they're doing and making progress. And eights do it to mask vulnerability and weakness. Mm. Right? So let me, I mean, Again, I, you know, it sounds like you're, you believe you're a type eight and with the Enneagram, it can only be self-validating, right? You can't, yeah. I can't tell you your type, only you can, right. but I would encourage you to read a, another book besides mine and compare threes and eights. Yeah. And I can recommend some to you. Yeah. That well, would, I find it fascinating, you know, because when I read both the eights and the threes, 
Uh, and again, I didn't, when I took it, I believed I was an eight. It was only when I started telling people that I tested as eight, some people were like, really? And I think it's because they see me as a public performer. That's where they come in with the three side of things. Do you know what I mean? Uh, okay. Yeah. But I mean, and, and again, I, I, I can run over somebody as I get older, it's less and less. Um, right. And as awareness grows, but I do feel badly about it. So it's very, it's very interesting. I mean, I do see the similarities and I think that's why people do it. But I, you know, I, um, I test it as an eight and I believe in the process. I really do. I believe those right. are very effective. So the unconscious motivation of the eight. So this is what drives the way they think, act and feel, yeah. right? So, but it's unconscious is to assert strength and control over the environment and others to mask weakness and vulnerability uh, and to deny it within themselves. So what weaknesses and vulnerabilities don't you want other people to see? Mm. Uh, the, I think the vulnerability that I don't want people to see is uh, that I'm not as confident in certain areas that maybe I project. Uh, mm. I'm creating content every day. <laughs> So when you go live on the radio every day, there's a, there's a performance thing there that, uh, or when you give a speech or you're writing a book, I'm, I'm just now starting writing my third book. And, um, uh, I think that, um, you never know if the idea is going to land. You never know if the methodology that the methodology that you're creating is really going to be that effective. I think you question that. I think, I think I do. I think it's normal for me to go, I believe this is good methodology. Um, I'm, it's, I'm developing it from a good place. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't know if the audience is going to buy it, you know? And, and, um, I think that's it, Ian. I'll be, you know, I love these kind of conversations. I'd never have them. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't spend time thinking about that. When you asked me that question, my first response was, I don't remember the last time that I actually sat down and went, what am I trying to mask with my strength? That's the truth. Like I, I, I'm sitting there going, I was trying to answer it, and I'm, and I'm trying to give you an answer because I, I really believe in the question. Yeah. But I don't know if I've truly wrestled with it because I am a very confident guy. I certainly present that way, but I do have insecurities and vulnerabilities, just like everybody else. So maybe it's, maybe it's that. Um, maybe it's because I'm in a content space, and you know, I'm hanging around the Dave Ramsey of the worlds and the Ian Morgan Crones of the world, and I do. right. Yeah, though. You know, you're, let's zero in for a moment on the insecurities then. Like what kinds of insecurities do you carry? Um, I think it goes back to my childhood and some of the stuff that I dealt with with my dad because I wasn't a good student. And I think it's uh, that people won't believe that I have it, that, I, that people won't think that I actually have something to contribute, that I'm not, uh, people won't think that I'm talented enough or good enough to be playing in the arena that I'm playing. And I think that's gotta be it. Um, hmm. Cause I was a C student, but I tested out, you know, all my aptitude tests were really strong except for math. <laughs> that, that's the one area in my brain that apparently is completely dormant. Um, that's mine. That's mine too, man. I'm my, that part of my brain is, is dark. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's true. I dropped college algebra six times, not because I was a loser. I just couldn't do it. and still can't. Still can't do math outside of an iPhone. Uh, but there was some real friction there with my dad because he was a, uh, an honor student, full ride ROTC to University of Michigan, still one of the great academic institutions in America. And I was bringing home C's and I think he just didn't know how to process it. And um, uh, he, he, he had instilled some fear in my life that if I didn't get the grades that he expected me to get, that I was going to be pumping gas. And I think it developed a chip that I'm really glad uh, was there. I've worked really hard. At, I'm going to be 46 in a month to try to destroy that chip. Um, so I think there's got to be some insecurities there around, do you have what it takes? And I've also worked with guys like John Maxwell, worked for him, and I've been around great communicators my whole life and always had a desire, Ian, to, to, to perform publicly. 
Uh, it's when I feel most alive when there's a pressure on me to deliver. Yeah. Well, and I've seen you do it and it's impressive. Well, thank you. But I guess I think that's probably what it comes down to is that little guy, <laughs> you know, 12, 13, 14, trying to disprove his dad that I did have what it take, even though I wasn't delivering the measurables in an area that he was expecting. And do you think, is your dad still alive? Yeah. And do you feel like that journey continues for you or that it's completely resolved? I want to tell you that it's resolved. I think that it is um, because I've owned it for a long, long time and dealt with it. And I have proven to myself, right? And I've proven to him, you know, that I'm not going to be pumping gas. Uh, But I do think there's something to every man and every woman still is that little kid, you know, and the girl wants to notice, be noticed and am I beautiful? And, and I think that uh, every guy wants to make his dad proud, you know, and I have, and I've heard that. And I don't think there's a deficiency there, but I do think it wears, I think that it, it forms something in you. You could speak to this. I'm, I'm out of, I'm over my skis right now, but I do think it forms a voice in our head that uh, has the potential to pop up all the time. Yeah, I think that's that's true. We carry uh, all of us are kind of multi-storied people. You know, stories run through our lives, right? Yeah. And I used to say about certain types um, that they kind of walk around with a three by five card on their forehead that says, "Do you love me yet? Yeah. Like, am I okay yet? Yeah. You know, it, does that sound like you or?" Are you, was that ever you? I think the question on my three by five card is, do you see that I'm pretty talented? Do you see that I've got what it takes that I'm, that I'm making it happen? I think it's that. Do you, do you validate? Do you see that I'm, that I belong? Part of it too, cause I was the little, the little skinny kid who loved the game of basketball and, uh, oops, hard. oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A five foot eight guy who can't jump over paper loves basketball. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was always the littlest kid on the playground, littlest kid on the team, uh, did not have tremendous physical talent, but I was a pretty good basketball player, but it was just limited. So my contributions were, I had to play defense better than everybody else. I had to pass the ball better than everybody else. I had to run the wind sprints faster. I had to win the suicide. Right. But there was a certain amount of performance that I had to deliver to get a chance to play because I was overlooked. Yep. Yeah. So what advice would you give today? You're 46. So what advice, maybe advice isn't the right word. What words of, of encouragement, consolation would you give your 20 year old self? Yeah. So much. I think the first thing would be stop trying to prove to everybody how talented and great you are and just get in tune with mm-hmm. where you're actually talented. What do you do best? And what do you long for? Stop, stop trying to attach your future to what you may be trying to prove and what are you dreaming about? What are you longing about? And, and, and stay focused on that. Uh, and then the second thing would be, um, Please, 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 please understand the tremendous value in patience. (laughs) Uh, You know, we we make perseverance and we tell romantic stories of people who persevered and talk about perseverance. And by the way, perseverance is it's huge. But the P word that we rarely talk about in movies and in books is the patience that requires you to persevere. You know, getting up and chopping wood is it's really fun and sexy to talk about, but it's the patience to realize that uh, it's going to take days and weeks and months to chop a tree down. And right. it's patience that actually allows you to keep showing up, knowing that um, I'm not seeing the big result right now, and I may not see it for a long time. So I would tell young Ken to really grab the power of patience along the journey. Hmm. So you you have this great book, number one, national bestseller called The Proximity Principle, the proven strategy that will lead to the career you love. 
uh, you guide people to find the job they love. That's kind of your jam. The question is I have for you is how? Yeah. Well, we start with get clear, you know, clarity is everything. Um, a clear person can then be a confident person and a confident person will be able to summon courage when life throws, you know, the, uh, roadblocks and the pitfalls at you. So we start with a methodology on knowing yourself, truly being self-aware. And that's why I love what you do. Um, and so we look at three big indicating questions. What do I do best? We are talking about talent here and in that talent bucket, we're talking about hard skills and soft skills. And, 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 and again, your, your character traits and personality traits are in fact talents. Um, and so what do you do best? Those are the tools that you can use in the marketplace to actually perform work. So that leads to the second indicator. What do you, what work do you love to do? And we're talking about a task, a function, a role that creates two clear measurements, high emotion, high devotion. So when I think about the work of broadcasting or speaking or writing, creating content, I get excited about it. Literally, uh, my pulse quickens, I get excited. When I'm actually performing the work, I am just in a zone. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, you know, world famous psychologist calls it flow. And so I, I am ecstatic in that moment. He calls it, it's a, it's a form of ecstasy. And, 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 and then I look up and what I thought was 20 minutes is two hours. And so, I, and I don't want to quit at the end of the day. I, I got to say, well, I got, I have more responsibilities, but that's what I mean. High emotion and, and, de, and devotion meetings that gets me fired up thinking about it and, and then engaging in it. And then I want to spend all the time I could possibly spend engaging in that work. Mm. That's passion. Then the third indicator is what results matter most to you. So again, we're talking about work here. What results of your work, because your work always produces results, what are the results that really make your heart come alive? And there's three questions there that you can ask. Who are the people I most want to help? All of us come right back to that. I just want to help people, Ken. I just want to help people. And that's our desire to, to make a contribution. And so what are the problems that those people have? When you think of the people you want to help, well, you're, you're ultimately thinking about the problem, the need, the challenge, the wants that they have. And then all of those challenges, needs, wants have a solution to them. So what solution or solutions to those people's problems fire you up? You answer those three questions and you've got some real clarity on the results that matter most. So they all come together. It's a simple formula. I use what I do best, talent, to do what I love to do most, that's passion. To produce results that matter to me, that's mission. Talent plus passion plus mission, that intersection. That's your sweet spot. That's where your unique role that God created you to fill is. And by the way, uh, there's multiple career paths and multiple jobs there. So it's not this silver bullet. It's only one thing that really intimidates the crud out of people. No, as long as you're in your sweet spot and you're using that formula you're going to be extremely fulfilled. And here's why. If I use my talent alone, Ian, in the marketplace, I can be successful. If I use my talent to perform my passion, I will be satisfied in my work. But if I use my talent to perform my passion, to produce results that are missional to me, now I'm in significance. And I'm, I'm, I'm way higher. And this is where meaning comes in. This is where self-actualization, as Maslow kind of gave to us all years and years ago. I think that's the formula. And that's what I'm teaching the audience. So we get clear first. We got to know who we are and, and, and what we want to do and why we want to do it. And then where we can do it in the marketplace. And that gets us started. And that's where then now we start to use the proximity principle, which is, you know, about connections and getting around the right people in the right places. So that's where we start all of our methodology. So it's interesting. Uh, in the, and by the way, this is incredibly, incredibly useful for every type because right now, obviously, people of every type, uh, many of them are adhering to quarantine and they have a lot of time to reflect. Some of them are out of work. Some of them are afraid they're going to be out of work. Um, and so, you know, this is an opportunity for them you know, as they kind of read the proximity principle, go through some of these ideas to really think through, okay, so this last effort, this last sort of uh, season of my life may be over. Mm. 
it, it may be over. My company, my restaurant, my whatever may be done for. So what's next, right? So I, I just feel like in some ways your book's going to have a second life uh, because people are going to be looking for some really clear advice about, well, how do I know what to do next? And by the way, and I know this sounds a little Pollyannish, but you know, um, when I was 49 years old, I, I made a really weird decision. I was living in Greenwich, Connecticut. I had a good job working for a family foundation, working in a church. Um, I was making really decent money, actually, particularly from the foundation. And um, left, left pastoring this church, and I felt like I got to move. I got to do something completely different with my life. Um, and I turned to my wife one day. I'd done a lot of stuff in Nashville. I'd been a songwriter here in the 90s. I, I, I knew people, and I looked at her, and I said, let's move to Nashville. And, and people said, are you crazy? And I said, probably, because I, I'm losing my jobs here. I just want to be a writer and a speaker. I, I'm just going to move to Nashville and hope that something good comes of it, right? It was, a, I mean, in other words, it was a big roll of the dice at that age. And I have to say, what it did for me was it made me feel like I was 25 again. I had to get down and, and really get scrappy. I, I, I had to reinvent myself. And it was one of the most exciting periods of my life. It's like I felt like, oh, wow, chapter two is as exciting and energizing as chapter one. Let me ask you, 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 did you, you had some inkling, though, that Nashville had some, some, some proximity. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to promote the book here, but this is what this is about. You felt like there were, there were the right people in this town and yes, it was a right place for you to reinvent yourself. Isn't that true? Absolutely. And I'll say this, and this is regardless of type that we're talking about here. Geography matters. Absolutely. It does. All right. Uh, tribe matters. If, if, if you want to run a hedge fund from Muncie, Indiana, good luck. If you want to run a hedge fund, you know, you really want to be in Manhattan, LA, Boston. Of course, now with technology, you can run from anywhere. But, you know, being in the right place with the right people. Like when I first moved to town, I met Anthony. Yeah. And then we started writing songs together. And then, you know, you, you start with this small little cabal of people. And then if you're very intentional about it, it just starts to grow out. And as it grows out, opportunities arise that you didn't see. You couldn't have imagined. I couldn't have imagined I'd get, another, I, you know, I'd write a second book. Then I'd write a third book and they'd both be bestsellers. I mean, you know, I couldn't, I, I could not have predicted in a million years what, what happened. Now, maybe I kind of went through your process without knowing I did, but, you know. First of all, the proximity principle, all I did was, just come up with a way of saying it. The principle says this, in order to do what I want to do, I've got to be around people that are doing it and in places where it is happening. And right. so the idea is it's a simple formula. The right people plus the right places equals something you just said moments ago, opportunity. If I want to go ride a train, I don't hang out at my house. I go to the train station. And right. proximity, here's, here's what the proximity principle does. It positions us where we need to be and propels us to where we want to be. Mm, and your right. story, and any successful person, by the way, in any industry has essentially done this. Uh, we just put a, put a little principle to it. And, uh, and, and what people need to understand is, is that when you are super intentional about connecting with, and again, it's not always coffee and lunch, uh, I learned how to do interviews by watching every Larry King Live episode that's ever been on. <laughs> this is true. Why didn't you go for Dick Cabot? I mean, Larry King, please. <laughs> <The> generational. <laughs> uh, um, I did watch some David Frost interviews. You know, I watched his famous interviews with Nixon to watch how he asked questions. Right. Um, I watched Bob Costas. Any interview that Bob Costas did, the guy was just, he, he really, really, really shaped the style of how I tried to do interviews. Um, you know, the speakers, you know, that I've been able to hang around, you know, watching the, the Andy Stanleys and the John Maxwells and the great communicators, how they communicate. Um, the point is, is that no matter what you want to do, whatever industry, you need to be around people that are doing that. Why? Well, simply put, let's say that you've got an idea right now and you're going, I want to change careers. I'm 49. 
it's really terrifying to switch careers at any age because you can speak to this. One of the great fears of all humans is the unknown. And so what right. the proximity principle does is help you get to a place where you actually know what you need to know so that you can confidently step out. And so you're able to clarify and verify. When I'm around people, they're doing what I want to do. I ask them, what's involved in your day? Give me the good, the bad, the ugly. Our brain's processing this. So now we have information we didn't have before. And so we learn about that. And then we also ask, well, how'd you get there? What was your path? And they tell us. Now, those two questions, Ian, allows the brain to clarify. And then the verify happens when the heart is able to connect with the brain. And once the brain processes the information, it's either going to say one of two things. All right. I do, in fact, want to do that. Or yuck, no way. I thought I wanted to do that. There's no way I could ever survive a day doing that. And so our head and heart get aligned when we put ourselves in proximity to people that are doing what we think we want to do. And then when we verify, now it's just repeating that process. And proximity gives us a chance to learn, do, and connect. And that is the formula for progress. And uh, anyway, you know, it's, it's a okay. idea, but it's intentionality. Yeah, okay, so... Let me throw a wrench in the gear here because this is an Enneag- this is an enneagram show. Um, you know, how do we factor if, if the enneagram is right? This sounds, by the way, very three or eight ish. You know, three sevens and eights are very aggressive. Yes. Um, this I can see working for three sevens and eights, but there are lots of numbers on the enneagram for whom this would be a very difficult exercise. Uh, And so I'm wondering, how do we accommodate for the fact that there are lots of different personalities in the world and this process that you're describing could be overwhelming, uh, could be confusing, could be uh, a real challenge for certain types, you know, like I could name the types that would struggle with it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because when we actually wrote the book, I, I actually sat down with a lot of introverts because I'm such an extreme extrovert. So I didn't walk through all the types, but I did want to get this. I wanted to walk this through uh, the principle with an introvert. And what I found was actually really exciting and the proximity principle works for, I think, all Enneagram types and personality types because um, it's not about the networking event that terrifies us all, even extroverts. It feels so gross. This is about one-to-one connection. This is about intentionality of identifying the type of people that I would want to learn from and the places where I can get an opportunity to observe and, and learn more. And mm-hmm. I, what I've learned, I actually had the opportunity years ago to interview Susan Cain, you know, who wrote Quiet, which is... Uh, yeah incredible yep. book and she's she's the champion for introverts and she opened my eyes to the fact that we live in really a extrovert dominated world the world is kind of skewed towards extroverts but i think as an extrovert one of the things that i've learned is the true skill of connection that introverts really teach us they really are the great one-to-one connectors and so this doesn't require this this naked audacity you know, to put yourself out there, this really is just about intentionality to make the connections. There's a sociology term uh, called the web of connections. And, and it really, uh, again, speaks to the ability to just make the meaningful connection. But I will also acknowledge that while any personality type can do it, I do understand it is more difficult for some because even the idea of the one-to-one connection is terrifying for a lot of people. Yeah, I was going to say it you know, there are, for, there are certain types. I think uh, well, you're going to have to learn how to power through it because I don't know of a greater currency for progress than connection. Yeah. And I would say then in some instances, one of the first connections certain types have to make, right? Yeah. Is uh, with, with someone who can mentor and walk them through this process because they won't be able to do it alone. Hmm. Glad you they, said they, the five they, people in the proximity principle, the archetypes, is the mentor. That yeah, you know how to connect with a mentor. Yeah, you 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 know, uh, as someone who's been in a twelve-step group for many many years, 
I was talking last night to a young guy on the program and I said, because he was expressing a lot of pain, I said, do you have a sponsor yet? He'd been in the program for a year. He said, no. Mm. And I said, the reason you are so confused is you have, you are up in your head and you have no one in your life to pick up the phone and call and say, I'm having trouble discerning X or Y. And I just need your help to give me some clarity or just to listen to me as I, as I begin to kind of process this. So I, I hope everyone listening, regardless of your type, you know, we're in this season where we're all feeling like, well, gosh, what's next for me in terms of, of my life? Yeah, do the proximity principle. Great, great model. But also, I, I think regardless of type, in fact, I would argue that three sevens and eights more than any other number actually need a mentor. Because you all are so, can sometimes be overconfident. Mm -hmm. And you need somebody in your life who can actually say no to you and you have to listen. Yes. You, 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 you need people in your life who can say, tap the brakes and you have to do it. That's uh, it. You know what I'm saying? There are other types that will be more uh, cooperative with a mentor, but, but three sevens and eights, it's much more difficult because they're just so dang confident and it's often just overconfidence. And, you know, that, uh, that means that if no one's checking their homework. Well, you're absolutely you know? right. Yeah. There, you need a mentor in your life. If you're a three, seven and eight, you need somebody to say no and whoa. And, right. and those two things are huge, but uh, something else I thought of while you were talking that I want to share and, and that is that in the book, The Proximity Principle, I talk about five people that you need to be in proximity to. So this isn't all just about getting the meeting to get the job. The mentor is one of them for that very reason. The second one is the peer and the right kind of peer for the same reason that you just pointed out. And I just want to encourage people of all types on this journey, you're going to have to have mentors, but you're going to have to surround yourself by the right peers. Um, you know this, I'm sure, but you know, the, the, the most famous study on relationships is out of Harvard. I think it's like 75, 80 some years old. Yeah. And David McClellan, one of the sociologists that is associated with the study, um, has said that 95% of our success or failure, this is so crazy heavy, and 95% of our success or failure is directly connected to the people we spend the most time with. Right. And, and, happy, and happiness, by the way. And happiness. That's right. And so this idea of a mentor and the right kind of peers who will push you, lift you, and hold you accountable on the journey is really, really important. So you're not on this journey all by yourself to make these connections. Uh, but those of you that struggle to really put yourself out there, that's where the peer and the mentor can really come alongside of you and, and help you. All right. So have you ever thought about using the Enneagram as a tool to help people discover what they were born to do? Uh, I think, it, I think a personality. Yeah. I mean, I think any personality test is really helpful as we look in that get clear, which is stage one of my seven stages and um, your personality type is in these tests. Enneagram is going to really help you see what I call qualities, right? So your abilities, your hard skills, the soft skills are really um, uh, illuminated when you take uh, an Enneagram. I do. I think it's a wonderful thing. So you can see, wait a second, I've got these natural uh, personality traits and character qualities that are very much as valuable as my hard skills. Yeah, I, I, I've done it many times. And I'll give you an example of just one. Uh, I worked with a woman in Manhattan and she was a one, the perfectionist on the Enneagram. And she was the CFO of a company, of a startup hedge fund. And they literally had overnight like $5 billion under management. Now that's not as big as a lot of hedge funds, but 5 billion bucks is a lot of money, right? Yeah, sure. For a bunch of 28 year olds, 30 year olds. And um, she said, yeah, they, they work in this open floor plan and there's pizza boxes everywhere. And I, I, I can't get them accountable to getting stuff done. And, and, I, and I'm worried that the SEC is going to get in here and look at our books, <laughs> you know, and, and she's talking to me and I said, well, you're a one on the Enneagram. You're dealing with sevens and eights mm -hmm. all, the, all day long, mostly sevens. It was a startup. Mm -hmm. And I said, you just need to know they're not going to change. Yeah. And 
you can't change them. There's no one, you know, no one can change anybody else. So the, you're not going to change them. So you have to make a decision as a one on the Enneagram. Are you uh, going to remain and live with all the anxiety that you are, you know, expressing to me right now? Or are you going to go find a new damn job? Yes. Because those are the choices here. You, you know what I mean? And you have and, to shift your mindset to, well, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm just going to do what I do and be perfect in it. And but she, and right. Qualities. But she knew yeah. that, or she took her about two or three months. She left. Of course. Yeah. Uh, she, she just said, I need to be as a one on the Enneagram. She was learning the Enneagram at that time. I need a more predictable yep. institutional a uh, place where I know what's expected of me, where there are rules, guidelines, and protocols, uh, where um, people really care about quality and don't cut corners to get to make the sale, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an example of where the Enneagram is a great tool for helping people discover what they were born to do, sometimes by eliminating That's right. yeah, the I things they're doing that aren't working. That's right. And I also think it helps you with environment. You know, I can't tell you how many phone calls we've had on the Ken Coleman show where somebody goes, Ken, I want to change careers, uh, but I don't know what career. I used to have a passion for what I'm doing right now. And I always go, okay, well, well, well when did the passion go away? And we dive into this. And what we find out is, is actually they're doing the right thing in the wrong place. Hmm. And I'll bet this lady was probably in that category in that uh, the, the job itself, the work that she was doing, uh, probably had the talent for it and probably enjoyed the work. Okay. And it was probably creating a result that matters. So she's there. You can be in your sweet spot, but be miserable because you're in the wrong place. Right. So you really helped her see this particular environment is creating such tension for your natural default personality that you're just going to be miserable. And th that's the phone call that we're getting from people is that they're in a toxic environment. Um, and it's just, it, there's such a rub there. So it, it, I do believe that personality is such a, um, it, it's a halogen light, but the only thing I would caution is that don't take a personality test, Enneagram or anything, and then get some suggestions from it and just assume that whatever's on the list and Enneagram doesn't do this, but I've seen a lot of best selling books that will take the disc and, and they'll say, well, if you're this type on the disc, here are 40 careers that might be. Right. For you. Yes. That's yes. a bad idea. And it gets back yeah. to what I said earlier. Let it inform you. Yes. Uh, but but make sure that you figure out the rest of that equation, which is talent, passion, and mission. Yeah. So I couldn't agree more. I tell people all the time, don't can don't limit, don't presume that certain numbers only have certain competencies. Yeah. You know, f fives like Bill Gates can yeah. run Microsoft. Yeah. Now, most people have a stereotype of fives that is like quiet, you know, want to be a coder, gamers at night. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, don't think that a four, the romantic or the individualist who tends to be an artist, couldn't be an accountant. That's right. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, like your type, you know, again, we're always saying the Enneagram doesn't want to put you in a box. It want to help. They want it helps. We want to help you see the box you're in and get out of it. That's it. So, yeah, you so, that. so huge. Yeah. So we, we want to make sure that our comp, we don't limit or uh, use stereotypes to limit what people can do because there are norms, you know, that, that, that go with types, you know, um, so I think, you know, people are more complicated than that. You know, you have to hold this stuff really lightly and not. I do want to say this, Ian, the, in getting to know you and have done several interviews with you now, one of the things that I really love about Enneagram is that it helps us see our, our, the underbelly of our positives and it helps us see the fears and limiting beliefs. And I think Enneagram is really powerful for that more so than anything else, any other personality test that I've have been associated with, it helps, helped me. And I think it helps everybody 
on the journey because you can be as clear as you want to be. You can know what your sweet spot is and go, but I'm telling you, you are going to be dealing with fear, doubt, and pride. Uh, those enemies never go away. And understanding my default fears and understanding the underbelly to my strengths is right. really helpful for me. It is life-giving and it will help you endure the race. So in closing, because we got to close up, can I give you, a, can I, not advice, but because I don't like that word, but counsel to someone who's an eight? Yeah, sure. I love it. Are you kidding me? So eights are not naturally refl- self-reflective people. Mm. And you actually sort of alluded to this earlier when you said, I asked you about weaknesses and uh, vulnerabilities. Yeah. And you said, gosh, I, I've never really thought about it. Like I've never really had someone ask me that question, you know. And then I asked you about insecurities. You, got, you were able to tap into that a little bit more. And, and one of the things I'd encourage you to do is slow down long enough or set time aside yes. to be more self-reflective about your inner world. Because for eights, everything's about the outer world. <laughs> They're just dealing with the external world to the exclusion of the internal world, right? I'm a four. I can, I'm just the opposite right? I, I'm very in touch with my interior world, not as in touch with my external world, right? Yeah. So I think one of the things that would make an eight more well-rounded is to stop and ask questions of themselves that would make them dive deeper into, uh, well, for an eight, what, what is it that I'm truly afraid of in life? Yeah. Uh, what, what, right, right. And, and then get a journal and right. write out what, what are my, what got me to the place where I'm so afraid of my vulnerabilities and weaknesses being exposed? Yeah. How did I get here? Yes. Um, and if you can't do that alone and you know, I'm a therapist, so, you know, obviously I'm selling my own profession. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in therapists, good therapists where this stuff gets worked out, you know, or could get worked out. You know? I, I, I endorse that and have done that. And, uh, uh, it was huge in dealing with some of the stuff I shared earlier, you know, just the right. performance stuff for my dad and affirmation, you know, what's yep. all this affirmation overdrive. You know? Okay. The second counsel I would give you is, did you ever read, uh, the, um, uh, the chapter on threes in the road back to you? No. <laughs> you just went right to eight, didn't you? Yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> it is what you do. All right, I want, I want you to promise me something. I want you to promise me that in the next couple of days that you will read the chapter on threes yep. and then call me. Oh, I'm, not say, I'm not saying you are a three. I'm just saying you have enough three qualities going on in your story and in your, and in your language, your, 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 the, the language that you, a lot of the language you use uh-huh. and the insecurities that you express are more three than eight. Uh, yeah. So don't let your wife tell you what type you are because you know, that's not her business or, you know what I'm saying? Like it's your business to figure it out. So, you know, it's 10 pages. I want you to go home and read the chapter on threes. Okay. And then call me, promise me you'll call me or text me or email me and tell me I'm an eight or a three. I would love to do that. Cause I've been, I've been dealing with the fact that I tested as the eight and then all these coworkers who work with me every day think I'm a three. Yeah. Pay attention to that. So I want you to go back and read the three. Yeah. And if I don't hear from you in a week, I'm literally going to take a note. I'm going to pester you. Well, you won't have to because I actually crave this stuff. And, and even though you've been a friend to me, you know, I, I live two miles from you. I would love to talk to you about it and I will do it. It's on my wife's uh, bedside table. I'll uh, digest it right away. Absolutely. All right. All right. Tell people where they can find you. And then I got to throw you off my show because I got Rachel Cruz on next. Oh my gosh. She's so much more delightful than me. So we got to get you to her. Uh, KenColeman.com is the place where you can connect with us on social uh, and again, the radio show is on multiple platforms, so you can learn all about that there. We've got some great free resources and I think a special deal right now on the proximity principles. So thanks for having me and, and letting me share that. 
Man, this has been a delight. Typology listeners, we love you. Don't forget the words of the great Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Until next time. <laughs>